This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. John chapter 14, verses 15 to 17, and then 23 to 26. This is the Word of God. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Then down to verse 23. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Father, we come before you aware that that although what we do now seems very ordinary, to read a book, to hear someone speak, yet Lord, you tell us in your word that as your word is read and preached, your spirit is at work. So Father, we thank you for that, and we pray that as we read your word together, as we hear your word preached, that, Lord, you would be at work, that this would be all of you, and that, Lord, you would use what is said and done here today to draw people to love you more and to obey your ways and to live for and serve you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn again to God's Word, this time in uh, John chapter 16, Um, a little bit later on in Jesus' sharing with his disciples in the upper room. Um, And we're going to be looking at verses 7 down to 15. You'll find that on page 1084. John chapter 16, verses 7 to 15. This is God's word. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness, and judgment, in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So far, we've uh, been working our way through the Apostles' Creed, and we've seen a a short 
but powerful couple of lines on what the Bible says we are to believe concerning the Father. We've had a chunk devoted to an incredible summary of the work of Christ. And now we come to the third person of the Trinity. And what do we get in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in the Holy Spirit. That's it. Why is that? Well, in the last hundred years, and especially in the last 50, sections of our church have been, I think, become fixated on what I believe is a damaging, self-centered, and quite distracting view of the Holy Spirit. One which accuses the church of the past of relegating the third person of the Trinity to a, a lesser position by supposedly barely or rarely mentioning him in all of our established creeds, confessions, and catechisms that have come down through the centuries, with the Apostles' Creed being a prime example. The biblical work of the Holy Spirit is addressed in almost every prayer and sermon in any half-decent reformed or confessional church. And yet, in, in almost every church that I've served in, I've heard people say, do you know, we never seem to talk about the Holy Spirit in this church. Now, what's usually meant by that is that we don't talk about the, the continuation of the apostolic gifts, signs, wonders, tongues, and continuing revelation. Those things that until the last few decades, the church had almost universally deemed to have ceased as we now have the full and final revelation of God in His true and perfect Word. Sinclair Ferguson has said that in the last few decades, the history of this doctrine, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, has sought to overturn almost two millennia of consensus on who the Spirit is and what role He is pleased to fulfill. The last line of the opening paragraph of our church's confession of faith takes from 2 Timothy 3.15, 2 Peter 1.19, and Hebrews 1.1-2 to, to say that because God has given us His full and final revelation in Scripture, God's former ways of revealing His will to His people have ceased. J.I. Packer, in speaking on this, says, misbelief abounds here. Some associate the Spirit with mystical states, both Christian and pagan. Others link the Spirit only with unusual individual Christian experiences. Feelings of emotional highs, seeking visions or new revelations, speaking in tongues, having the power of healing. But even if these things were to come from the Holy Spirit, rather than maybe some other spirit, they would still only be secondary elements of his work. Now, I'm sure there is a range of views on this topic in this building this morning, but Packer is right. Our modern focus on the Holy Spirit is too often around the continuation or ceasing of apostolic spiritual gifts that do happen in Scripture, but are actually never the focus, never the main work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, even in Scripture where they are meant to be an aid to belief before the text of Scripture was completed, they often prove to be a distraction due to people's sinfulness. So this morning we want to ask the question, what actually is the central work of the Holy Spirit? Well, this morning we're going to turn to John's Gospel and Jesus explaining the work of the Holy Spirit to his disciples in the upper room. In these verses from chapters 14 and 16, Jesus teaches about receiving the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and for want of a better word, the desire of the Holy Spirit. So let's start where every Christian starts, with receiving the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14, verses 15 and verse 23, the first thing we see is that we receive the Holy Spirit by loving God and obeying what God commands. The Holy Spirit is gifted to those who have had their dead, rebellious hearts made alive by the Spirit so that they can actually love God, their Maker and King. 
John 6, 63 says, it is the Spirit that gives life. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, it would be a strange thing if someone claimed to be devoted to their king but refused to follow his commands. In, in fact, it would show that you didn't really love the king at all. You were just saying you loved him for some other reason. There are many in our world today who label themselves as progressive Christians. They claim to follow Christ, but believe that they have progressed beyond the, in their view, dangerous and damaging commands of the Bible, which might have been true at a time, but are now somewhat embarrassing or even maybe harmful to a world that now knows better. Often they have a view that the age of the Father was the Old Testament, the age of the Son was the New Testament, and now we are in the age of the Spirit who gives new and different revelation that interestingly almost always agrees with whatever our sinful world has decided was morally okay last week. This is simply not what the Bible teaches, and it gets the Trinity all wrong. We have one God. He has always said the same thing, and in His three persons, He is completely and fully united. And although it is important that we read Scripture in its context and in its fullness, it remains the infallible, unchanging, and complete Word of God. If we truly love God, if we have been brought to life by the Spirit so we can respond to God's call, repent, and believe the gospel, if we have been made capable by the Spirit of loving God, we will seek to love the things God loves. We will seek to follow God's commands, which are a reflection of who our God is and the way He has designed us to live. We will follow His commands around worship, so that we can worship Him rightly His way in spirit and truth. We will follow His moral commands because they lead to a better story, even when our sinful world hates us for it. Those who have been saved, who by the Spirit truly love God, will keep His commands. By our fruit, we will be known. And those who have been saved receive the Holy Spirit, the Helper, who will help us to love God and follow His ways. The second thing we see about receiving the Holy Spirit is that it is given or, or sent forth from the Father and the Son to dwell within us. We see this in chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, verses 23 and 24, and chapter 16, verse 7. The Spirit of truth is sent forth by and from the Father and Son and is equal and united with Father and Son. Look at uh, ver chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus replied, if, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now, why does that matter? It matters because we can be so unmoved. We can be so blasé about this, forgetting that it's absolutely and completely mental. <laughs> that our perfect creator of the universe, God Almighty, would come and dwell not only with his people in Christ, but within his people by the Spirit the comforter, the helper, the legal counsel on our behalf, the prosecutor of our sinful souls who shapes his people into those who truly love God and obey his commands. When we become Christians, God himself comes to live within us as we are, sinful, fallen, a mess, but he has no intention of leaving us that way. C.S. Lewis explains this really well. You've probably heard this before. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. 
God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's, he's getting the drains right. He's stopping the leaks in the roof and, and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're, you're not surprised by that. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage. But he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. The fact is God saves wretches like us. His Spirit comes to dwell with us and in us. But He is making us into the new creations we now are and will one day fully become. Are we ready for that? Are we willing to leave behind the sinful ways of the world and be shaped into the people of God? His word of truth sets out that we now are. So we've seen that the Holy Spirit is received by those who love God and keep His commands and is given by the Father and the Son to dwell within us. But what actually is the work of the Holy Spirit? We see it in chapter 14, verse 26. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. See, the primary work of the Spirit is to conform us to the image of Christ. It's to to bring the words of this book of life to life in us, to allow us to understand God's Word, Christ's teaching, which as verse 17 reminds us, the world cannot understand or accept because they don't have the Spirit. The Spirit's role, the Spirit's job is to open our eyes to the truth. Without the Spirit, no one would believe in Christ. No one would love God. No one would obey God's commands. No one would know the truth. The Spirit, like the Father and the Son, is central to our salvation. Chapter 16, verses 8 to 11 tell us that without the Holy Spirit, none of us would have become Christians because none of us who were in and of the world would have been convicted. Jesus lays out three ways here that the Spirit will convict the world. Firstly, he will convict the world of guilt in regard of sin, verses 8 and 9. As we have said, one of the the chief works of the Holy Spirit is to bring dead people to life. Without Him waking our cold, dead hearts, giving us an awareness and a disgust towards our sin of rejecting God, none of us would ever come to faith. And as God's truth is preached, the Spirit convicts the world of its guilt and sin. We see this in all of the preaching in the Bible, and it leads to one of two responses. The Spirit hardens the hearts of some, leading to rejection or anger, and softens the hearts of God's people so that they come to saving faith. Think of John chapter 6, where Jesus is teaching on the truth about himself. And in verse 66, we are told, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. He then turns to the 12 who have heard the same teaching and asks, are you going to leave as well? The response from Peter is, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of Israel. See, the Spirit works through the Word to convict the world of sin. I wonder, have you heard or felt that conviction of the Spirit for your sin? 
Have you repented and and turned from it to the one who has the words of eternal life? This is how someone becomes a Christian. It's not by being nice or respectable. It's not by going to church or abstaining from certain bad habits, although those are good things. It's by the Spirit causing us to realize the depth of our sin, our need of a Savior, and helping us to repent and believe the gospel. Secondly, the Spirit convicts the world in regard to righteousness. Verse 10, (coughs) just as the Spirit works through the word of truth to convict people of their sin, He also works to show people the righteousness of Christ. Verse 10 says, it is the Spirit's role to help people see the righteousness of Christ because Jesus is returning to the Father. As verse 7 says, that is a good thing, because Jesus, as fully human, was bound by his humanity. He preached for three years in a relatively small region of the Middle East. But God the Spirit dwells in every believer. God the Spirit works through the Word as the truth is proclaimed, and we have seen the results. The church has been hated and hounded and oppressed and hurt for 2,000 years, and yet it has grown and grown. Persecution hasn't stopped it. Hypocrisy hasn't stopped it. Evil people outside or within it haven't stopped it. False teaching hasn't stopped it. Apathy hasn't stopped it. The devil hasn't stopped it. Every day, more and more people hear the truth of God's Word, are convicted of their sinfulness and of Christ's righteousness by the Holy Spirit, and go from being dead and facing judgment to being alive and looking forward to everlasting fullness of life. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is the work the Spirit does as the church fulfills her great commission to go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything God has commanded. As we prayerfully share the gospel in the places God has put each and every one of us, as we offer to open and read the Bible with a friend or a colleague, or we invite the people around us to come and sit under the preaching of the Word, the Holy Spirit will show God's people Christ, and they will come to saving faith. Our job is to teach and to show. It is the Spirit's job to convict and convert, and He will bring all God's children home. We just need to, by the Spirit's help, be willing to go. Thirdly, then, the Spirit will convict the world in regard to judgment. Verse 11. Some churches don't like to talk about hell or judgment anymore. And in Northern Ireland, it has been used as a tool of fear to batter people into moral behavior, rather than as a solemn and loving warning of a reality that we all face without Christ. Jesus doesn't give us the option to deny hell and judgment or to bury our heads in the sand about it. The Holy Spirit convicts us that there is a day of judgment. It is a wonderful day in that the devil and all evil and sin will be dealt with, but it is a terrible, terrible day for those found to be without Christ, for those found to still be in sinful rebellion against their God and King. This is a cause for us to rejoice in the one sense that God has rescued His people from this fate, and that He will put right what sin has ruined as He has promised to do. But it's also a warning. It's a warning to us who are in Christ to go and do what Christ has commanded us to, and share the gospel with others as it was shared with us. In that sharing, the Holy Spirit convicted us of the guilt of our sin, of the righteousness of Christ, and of the judgment to come. 
And we, by the Spirit at work, responded and were saved. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. That is why the Spirit came, to convict the world and save God's people. It is an incredible, wonderful work. We are here today. The church is growing today because of this work of the Holy Spirit. So we thought about how incredible it is that we receive the Holy Spirit. We thought about how uh, we thought about what the saving work of the Holy Spirit is. And then finally, and, and very briefly, I want to look at chapter 16, verses 12 and f- to 15, and consider what I've, I've maybe poorly worded, the desire of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and quite simply, the desire of the Holy Spirit is to point away from himself and towards Jesus. If we think about those charismatic prosperity gospel groups out there, the Bethels of the world, who claim to have apostolic authority, who claim to have new teaching, which is often in direct contradiction to actual Scripture, or who claim to have personal healing power, but were nowhere to be seen when COVID struck, or who claim to speak in tongues as a sign that they are on a higher plane of spirituality than others, what's the common denominator? It's that it's all about them. For them, the Spirit is a power they use to draw attention to themselves. It is not the desire of the Spirit that people look to us. It's not even the desire of the Holy Spirit for people to look to and worship Him. Yes, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Yes, the Holy Spirit is God. Yes, the Holy Spirit is worthy of worship. But the reason the historic creeds and confessions of our church don't have large passages or chapters on the Holy Spirit and are instead infused throughout by the work of the Spirit is because the Holy Spirit's role, as verse 14 says, is to bring glory to Christ. The Holy Spirit comes to make the truth of Christ and His Word known to the world. And as verse 13 says, He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit does not come to bring new or fresh or different revelation. He is of one mind with Father and Son, one God. He comes so that by His power we can understand the words of truth God has given to us. It's what we see in the New Testament. Look at verse 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. We know from reading the Gospels that the disciples hear all that Jesus says to them, but we know that until the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and begins to guide them into the truth, as verse 13 says, they fail to grasp all of what Christ is saying. The Spirit's role is to glorify the Father and the Son by applying the truth of God's Word to God's people, convicting us of sin, righteousness, and judgment so that we will be saved. Then the Spirit comes to dwell in and with us, shaping us more and more into those who love Christ, who love His truth, who obey His Word, and who live for and serve Him now and for eternity, and who by the Spirit are empowered and emboldened to go out and share Him with a world in darkness, facing judgment, a world that needs the truth and the life that comes only through the incredible work of the Holy Spirit as it is set out in Scripture. Should we pray? Father, 
we thank you that you did not leave us as orphans, but that, Lord, you sent the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit who comes to dwell within us, God in us, us imperfect, sinful, broken vessels, and yet you make a home in us. Lord, we thank you that you do not leave us as we are, that by your Spirit you rescue us, you convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, that you help us to to see the truth of your Word, to see the truth of our sin, to see the truth of who you are and of all you have done for us in sending Jesus. And Lord, by your Spirit, you help us to respond. If it was not for your Spirit, we would be lost. So Lord, we thank you for the Spirit. We thank you for what he does for us and in us. We thank you that he wants to shape us into your people. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be willing and uh, and joyful about the Spirit's rebuilding efforts in us to make us more like Christ, to make us those who love you deeply and want to obey and follow your word and serve you in the world by sharing your truth with others that the Spirit can convict them to and bring them to saving faith. So Lord, we pray that you, by your Spirit, are with us now. Be with us as we leave this place. And Lord, help us to live for you, to serve you, to love you, to follow you, and to share you with those that we love and those that we are with. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.